you can then envisage a constructivist model not only of the learning process, but also of the translation process, where, just as the teacher becomes a facilitator of learning, of activities, uh, the source text becomes just one element in a multiple range of factors that have to be considered. Knowledge is created in interaction, bearing in mind all these factors, and the translators are seen as making active decisions, intervening in the process, just as in the constructivist model, the students are seen as being active interveners in the process. Kirali will walk into his first class and say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, what do you want to do? Oh, we want to be, oh, you want to be translators? Good. So what do you think we should do? You want to translate? Good. What would you like to translate? Oh, you want to do that kind of text? Bring me some texts. Okay, and it goes that far, where the students themselves will say what they want to do, what they want to translate. Because let's face it, you know where you want, well you should know where you want to be in three, five years time. You should know what kind of activities are going to help you get there. And you should especially know what kind of texts you would like to be working on, what field you would like to be working in. Okay. His constructivism goes that far. I remember him giving one talk, uh, I used to invite him quite regularly to, to, to Tarragona. Um, he, he gave a, a quite wonderful talk that students said they wanted to do subtitling. This was before we had uh, dot .sub and, uh, and these free online uh, subtitling programs. So he says, all right, okay, what should we do? We'll do a film. What film? Oh, there's a film. We've got a film on the internet. Great. How do we do it? And he said, I don't know. This is the instructor. Very hard thing to say in Germany if you're an instructor, getting paid to be an instructor. I don't know. And uh, the students went off and con contacted a company, a subtitling company, asked how they did it, asked if they could do a film uh, as a training thing for the training exercise, offered the result to the company for free. If they would get the software, they got the software, they learned the software. They discovered the rules of subtitling. They discovered how to use it and did the project collectively okay. with the instructor looking on and learning with the students. That would be uh, a quite extreme, I think, constructivist environment. So Corelli, interestingly, suggests that the way we think about translation is similar to the way we think about learning. My question is, has any research been done on this? If teaching is in itself a mode of research, which it might be, then a lot has been done, because we're all teaching all the time. And Corrali's research, and his book, and his articles, are often based on the experience, what happened in class, what I discovered that works really well. The trouble is that most of the research I read on training or education is of this kind. I used to be a transmissionist, then I read Kirali's book and I was enlightened. I picked up all the methods he proposed and used it in class and the students' feedback was really great. Hallelujah. End of research. And there are lots and lots of articles like that. And I think it's good people are explaining what happened, and they're explaining the good things that happened. But they never explain the bad things. Nobody writes up research articles on failure in a teaching process. We used a new method with a new teacher, and the feedback was great. We did awareness raising activities, and the students became very aware. Whoa. Feedback was great. We use the new methods, and the students feel they are ready to enter the labor market. Feedback is great. <laughs> What's missing, I have a lot of things are missing, but with, with the last one, is 
It, it's really, really more interesting to get feedback from the students six months out, one year out, two years out. And instead of asking, do you like me? Do you like my class? Uh, yeah. Help me with my research project by writing a good evaluation. Um, get people who have actually entered the market. Our experience, everybody has trouble entering a market. It's never a smooth process. And asking them, did your training or education help you? Did it give you the things you need? What didn't we give you that you now find you need? Okay. I'm, I'm missing a lot of good survey data of that kind, which should be more critical. There is a, an overabundance of uh, teachers who use research as a kind of self-praise activity. Uh, usually, I'm really not reducing it too extremely uh, in these examples. Before I get on to one particular research project that I'd like to talk about, um, I'll just give you some of the problems that are involved. I had a research student a few years ago who had a great idea. She said, we're doing we're training interpreters badly. We're doing it all wrong. Everybody gets trained in consec and then uh, simultaneous. You know, because people think consecutive is easy and simultaneous is hard, so they want to go from you know, easy to hard. And she was never able to conduct an experiment on this. Because you have to do the experiment with real students in a real learning situation because the people who set up the learning situation are all convinced that the current order is correct. So it would be unethical to expose students to the risk that the new order might be bad. It's like testing out new drugs, okay? Except we've got no chimpanzees or rats to train as translators, <laughs> so we can't do it. So that particular one remains untested. Another one, for example, I think everybody should be trained in, in, in interpreting first and then move on to translation or conferences. So I think that, that people learn about mediated communication through interpreting, through oral activity, and that everybody should get that. But the powers that set up our training programs say that's sort of unethical because they're so convinced that the current situation, the current structure, is the correct one. Another problem is a huge one of quality. Uh, often the research is set up and you assume that as students progress, the quality of their translations gets better. What actually happens is the quality of their translations gets more like the teacher's perfect translations because the teacher is the one assessing them. So there's a, a real ethical problem, a huge problem around quality, which I'll just uh, point out there. Another one is, is this insistence on authenticity. Uh, Kerala, you've seen, and many others, insist that when we translate, we must get authentic texts or authentic tasks. That means taken from the world outside the classroom. And that sounds great. However, it seems to me that a training program should go in some kind of progression, either from easy to difficult, or it should focus on particular skill sets as you go along. For example, I can give classes in editing and revising, post-editing. I can give classes in uh, uh, syntactic reformulation. I can give classes in terminology management. All right? An authentic task says all these come together, but to learn them, it's far easier to have them separate. So, the notion of authenticity comes up against the simple concept of pedagogical progression or planning your lessons. Uh, and personally, I'm not a great believer in authenticity except at the end of the training process. That's when you should be doing the whole lot together on real world assignments. In the actual progression, I love getting texts and manipulating them, doctoring them putting mistakes in, putting in false friends, traps for students, or uh, problems that correspond to the thing I want to be teaching that particular week. Okay? So this is where the authenticity bit uh, becomes a little difficult for me. 
But it becomes an ethical debate. I have serious colleagues, colleagues who tell me, no, you shouldn't do that. You should be authentic all the time. I've, I've had, I gave an exam once in a translation school, and uh, I had a fellow teacher there, what do you call it, vigilating the exam, supervising the exam? Came up to Proctoring, thank you. There's a mistake in the source text. He said, students, students, disregard the mistake. I put the mistake in there, so they wouldn't. There's just this mentality. That, that the in a serious exam, the source text should be perfect. My fellow teacher hadn't realized that I'd actually put in inconsistencies in the text to see if the students would pick them up and what they would do with them. Okay. Ethical problem, or, or a different view of what training is and what translation is, I guess. And then, I must admit that you could probably imagine that when I do train translators in that sort of class. Uh, my aim, in a way, is to put problems there or bring up problems so that students will discuss the differences. You'll get them do, doing different translations in groups or pairs or whatever. And then I'm very happy when they disagree. When they get up and really argue with each other. For me, that's good teaching. When the students are arguing with each other and not looking at the teacher. <laughs> You know, to say which one is right, and I don't know which one's right. And actually, that's when I do bring in translation theory. I don't teach theory when I train translators. I just bring it in when there's a debate going on, and they need words to put, to describe their differences. I can give a few words, words and concepts. You know, that's sort of the role that theory plays for me. But I've had others who, who see that a class where students are arguing amongst each other, or with each other, is a bad pedagogical environment. I think it's great. Okay. But we've had, you know, it's just a different concept of what a good class is or what education is. <coughs> this is a research project where we said, okay, let's see if we can find out what skills we are teaching, what skills we should be teaching. And this was carried out by Anne Lafever, who was talking here last year. She works for the United Nations, now in Geneva, and she's interested in the recruitment exams that are used in the United Nations and in the uh, European uh, Commission Translation Service and in other similar organizations. Okay, recruitment exams for translators. You might be interested in this one. Now, uh, Anne went over and got a whole lot of things just through the literature that translators should be able to do. That's a lot, and it goes on to these things, and it goes on to these things as well. I think there were 40-something of them. You're supposed to learn all these things. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yes, okay. Right down to detecting mathematical errors and uh, working with Excel, PowerPoint, we have translation memories. Wow, it just all makes sense. Okay. The idea was rather than see what people actually learn in class, because all the classes are different, let's check how well our training fails. It's a bad sentence, isn't it? Let's see to what extent our training fails. So, instead of looking at the instructors and the students, this research looked at the people in the organizations after recruitment who spend their time revising. When you get a job in these organizations, for one year or two years, you work with a reviser. So there are people who are professional revisers revising the work of new recruits. And we asked these revisers, which of these skills do you spend most of your time on? Okay. Which of the ones are most frequent? Okay, so from that long list of 40 or so, we're going to get the ones that the revisers tell us students are not being trained in. Sneaky. 
except they're not very interesting. Well, produce translations that flow smoothly. Ability to be invisible. Uh -huh. Work out the meaning of obscure passages. Yes, often the new recruits will opt for literalism rather than work on things they don't really know, but that's to sort of to be expected. Write elegantly, regardless. This means even when the source text is inelegant, your translation must be elegant. It's rather like one of those Yang Fu principles, isn't it? Anyway, um, because people have been trained to follow the source text, but in these orga in orga organizations, that's not what you need. You need a, a beautifully elegant target text. Capture nuances. Adapt to in-house style conventions, but that you would expect because they don't know it before they get there. Recast sentences, and then it's lacking subject knowledge. Uh, those are the most frequent ones. We also ask, which are the most important? Not just you spend your time correcting them, but of these, which are the, would have the most negative impact on the organization? Okay, so these are really the things that we should be focusing on. Completeness. People not finishing the translation, or not finishing the text in some way. Rather surprising that people would do that, however. Clarity. Again, invisibility. Knowledge of the source language. Not knowing your source language well enough. Coherence. Spelling rules. Grammar. <laughs> Working out the meaning of obscure passage. Okay, we had that. Extensive vocabulary, nuances, punctuation rules. It's, it's really quite surprising that for all the fancy things we've been doing in translator training over the past 20 or so years, you know, the cultural aspect brought in and the client and the score boss and all that, the things that are really letting us down are not finishing, not knowing the language, not knowing the grammar, not knowing the spelling. This is quite alarming, I suggest. And should send signals back to the people designing the programs that, hey, you're not doing this well enough in those particular areas. However, the real thing, the real message is that we have to rethink, I, I suggest, the whole range of what we're teaching and how we teach. But not, don't get too lost in the how. A lot of it is in, still in the what. The basics of it are not getting and sort out for each training program what skills and knowledge people have to have before they arrive in the course. Here, you're very well selected. So a lot of the, a lot of the quality of the output is the quality of the input. That's very good. Then, sort out what you should get in this particular training process, which is finite in time. And then remember that a lot of those skills a lot of the things mentioned there happen after the training. That when you get into a job, your training doesn't stop, your learning doesn't stop. Things like style books. I'm not going to teach you the United Nations style sheet. I should teach you how to use style sheets and to realize that there are different ones out there. Once you get into that particular place, you have to learn to write according to the United Nations style book. Same thing with translation memories or machine translation. We can't give you fixed things. That's going to happen once you're in place in the job. So I think that working from uh, uh, the famous findings, rather than be shocked at all the things we're not doing, we should go back and take a good look at what skills you have before you start training, what skills you'll acquire after you start training, and then focus on a very reduced set of skills for each particular training program. That's an example of what I would call a quite useful and challenging piece of empirical research.